Welcome to our webinar series where we make hump day hemp day. I'm Robert Colangelo, host of Green Sense Radio and co-founder of Hemplit Farms. I'll be your moderator for the webinar series. Each Wednesday, a different hemp expert from academia, government, business, and farming will be featured to exchange ideas and share their experience with hemp. We're here to raise the bar of integrity with like-minded professionals in the hemp community to, to disseminate factual information so that we can all make good decisions. This is a volunteer effort and a labor of love led by Hemplet Farms, Purdue University Extension Services, Newton County Soil and Water Conservation District, Biobin, Northwest Indiana Forum, and the Midwest Hemp Council. The Midwest Hemp Council is the leading association representing the hemp industry. And for those who are not a member, I recommend you joining. I have a question for you. What's the best nation in the world? Let's see, USA, the US, it's a donation. And if you can't join the Midwest Hemp Council, please consider making a donation to support their great efforts. Any amount is appreciated. Jamie Campbell is the executive director and she's a tireless soldier helping to build this industry. Get to know her, she can help you thrive in the hemp markets. Our strategy was to start this series with the big picture and then drill down into specific areas of interest. The first presentation will provide context for future discussions by presenting economic information on the hemp market. With that, I'm happy to introduce our first speaker who will kick off the hemp series. Dr. Maria Marshall is professor in the Department of Agriculture Economics at Purdue University and director of the Purdue Institute for Family Business. Dr. Marshall has both a research and a teaching program focused on small and family business development. Her program goal is to increase the viability and sustainability of small and family businesses as they develop and mature throughout their life cycles. Her research provides relevant information and publications to entrepreneurs, family business owners, and policymakers. She received a PhD in agricultural economics from Kansas State University. Dr. Marshall will provide an economic overview of the hemp market. The overview will include trends associated with licensing, pricing, and production of hemp. She'll also provide a summary of recent producer surveys detailing 2019 producer expectations expectations and experience. In addition, she'll touch on the coronavirus and its projected economic impact to the hemp market. With that, I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Maria Marshall. Maria, it's all yours. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so let's uh, talk about the big picture. If you're wondering, I'm, I'm not sure if I would yet call myself a hemp expert. Um, as with others, this is a new market, a new, a new trend, a something new for a lot of us. The reason that I'm interested in working on hemp and in hemp is because uh, as the small business business, a small business specialist for Purdue, I work with a lot of small businesses that are starting on and sometimes new markets, sometimes markets that are have been established for a long time, but it's new. And so um, I'm going to start with an over an economic overview, and then I'm going to end first things to consider as you start in any new industry as as you start a new business. So um, the demand for uh, hemp is definitely projected to increase um, by $8.9 billion by 2023. Uh, we've seen an annual expansion of about 26%. And by 2028, we do expect to demand for hemp to, um, is expected to reach 100, I'm sorry, $11.8 billion. Now that demand has been increasing due to the farm bill. Um, um, increased uses of CBD and CBD infused products, as well as uh, the fact that cannabis isn't legal uh, federally. And so people are uh, might be switching and using uh, hemp for stress relief and other types of uh, products that um, cannabis would have been used for instead. Um, the hemp seed market um, is, um, the international hemp seed market demand is also um, increasing and expected to, um, I'm going to move, move this over here, um, is, and expected to, to increase, and it's valued at $308 million in 2017. The market is projected to grow um, by a compound annual grade of 24% through 2025. China is the largest supplier of hemp seed, um, and Europe's the largest consumer, followed by North America when it comes to, to hemp seed. Um, so some hurdles faced in 2019. 
Um, we saw that weather was a big hurdle um, uh, just all over with, uh, it was super wet and, and all these other things. So that was a huge hurdle in 2019 in terms of production. Pest and disease were also a problem. Um, just grower and experience. This is a new hemp, for example, Illinois and Indiana or started, just started to grow in, in 2019. Um, and so there's just a lot of an experience and you'll see how that plays out throughout the market and in, in, in terms of pricing and, and yields. Um, of course, there's supply chain bottlenecks, it's a new supply chain people are trying to get used to, to contracting or not contracting, getting into the spot market, figuring out what those supply chain um, things are going to be. So there was that, um, that as well. Um, and also some regulations, uh, new government regulations, new things being put in place, uh, misunderstandings. So I just put in the the um, daddy, daddy Burt Hemp got, uh, company just because um, the FDA sent a whole bunch of cease and desist notices in 2019 telling people to stop saying that they, um, they could be used for medicinal purposes. Um, only one company has um, been approved by FDA um, to use uh, hemp for seizures. So there was a lot of that going on right now in terms of, you know, kind of the market's wide open and everybody's trying to figure out what they're doing. So those are some of the hurdles that affect the market in 2019 and will continue to affect the market in 2020 as things start to get to get more settled. Uh, U.S. license acres, these are 2019 numbers uh, that I'll talk about later, but um, by 2028, we are expected it, expected to reach 371 million pounds of production of, of biomass. Um, the number of state licensed growers grew by 480% last year. That's a huge increase. Um, and we'll see how that plays out as well. Uh, we might be very similar to Canada where we have a boom and, bo a boom and bust, um, where tons of growers come in, it's a new market, people are understanding and then prices fall. And so we'll, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, the total licensed acres were estimated to be 475 about 476,000. That's by uh, Hemp Benchmark. Boat Hemp estimated it to be about 528,000 in 2019. Um, usually, we'll see 60% of the licensed acres actually uh, planted. Um, uh, the, so, the 2019 estimate was about 45% planted. Uh, so resulting in a substantial less number of, of actually so licenses have less although there are some anecdotal data that people got licenses for however many acres and then they planted more that they were licensed for so we'll see how uh, we'll should be seeing that stabilize as, as time goes on um, and 93 percent was planted for hemp biomass here are some comparisons of the growing seasons uh, growing acres for 2018 2019 we'll see that Indiana and Illinois just started growing in 2019. We see that Michigan had like went from zero to 32,000, for example. So there's a, a, a lot of increase. That's that 480% increase in growers. The top three states, Colorado, Kentucky, and Oregon, you'll see also just a huge leap in the number of licensed acres in 2019. We'll see how that plays out. I know Indiana expanded the, no, the number of licenses that they were going to be able to use in 2000, uh, using 2019. Um, so 2019 is a huge, uh, a huge increase in the number of, uh, of acres that we'll see um, going and we'll see in 2020. I know Indiana, sorry, Indiana expanded the number of acres. And so we'll see if they use all those licenses or not. Um, here's a, a range of prices uh, for early. This is early in the season in 2019 for hemp flower. You'll see um, the, the thing here is I wanted to give you an example of low and high prices from uh, the, the, state, the states that grow the most. So you'll see Oregon, their top prices, uh, their higher prices were around 800 uh, pounds, uh, $800 per pound. And you have can, uh, Colorado is, can be as low as $200 per pound for hemp flour. Now, Oregon has um, gone into a niche, a niche market, well, not a niche market, but an interesting market. They've seen an increase in in demand from Texas and Florida and the mid-Atlantic from um, people smoking hemp flour, flour uh, in areas where cannabis isn't as readily accessible and then we'll have more affluent city centers. And so they just might be good into that market and be able to demand a higher price. Prices for whole plant biomass um, as well, you'll see a, a distribution all the way from Colorado, North Carolina getting a higher price to Tennessee. I think what's interesting, what's important here is to think about the range of prices and not getting stuck on this is the highest price I see, so this is what I'm going to get. 
So I'm talking a little bit about the Indiana survey. Um, and this is from all the Indiana licensees. So um, we asked, what did they do with their crop? You'll see that about 41% sold to a processor, but 33% are still holding on to their crop. They have not, they're looking for processors. So they're looking to sell in the spot market. So they're, they're still hanging on to that. And about 26% destroyed their crop or had to destroy the crop. I'm assuming it wasn't voluntary. <laughs> um, so um, we asked what are the production costs. Um, so I was interested in, and people never want to tell you exactly how much they got, but it's interesting to, under, to know if expectations were lower or higher to be depending uh, based on their revenue or their costs. So the blue uh, box is revenue. And you'll can see that a little over 60% had lower revenue than they expected in 2019. Um, and on the flip side, um, about 39% uh, had higher costs than they were expecting. So again, it's an experience figuring out where you're gonna sell, who you're gonna sell into that supply chain, how it's playing out in terms of expectations of pricing and costs. So we also asked, um, did, uh, ind did individuals have a production or marketing contract in 2019? Again, the uh, blue is production and the orange is marketing. You see that about 44% said, yes, they had a production contract, but the vast majority do not. So over 50% do not have a marketing contract and do not have a production contract. The marketing contract is just substantially higher than the production contracts. Um, so of course I was interested in considering that a whole bunch of people are still holding on to their crop still, um, were they likely, what was the likelihood of them entering into a production or marketing contract in 2020? Again, you see blue product, blue is production, orange is marketing, still a vast majority over 60, about 65% will not enter, um, higher than that actually, will not, are very, not likely or slightly unlikely to enter into a production or marketing contract, which is interesting considering that a lot of people are trying to sell in the spot market and spot market prices are substantially lower right now. So that's an interesting, an interesting thing about this market. Now, let me go back to that. That could be due to a lack of people understanding what, what, are, con what are the contracts available? What are the means? Um, people that are growing hemp that are not used to having production or marketing contracts. So all of those could be playing into the, the lack of wanting to go into a contract right now. Um, and of course, I, I wanted to, uh, to understand if people thought that the hemp market was risky. Um, and 65% uh, said that they considered the hemp market either very risky or extremely risky. What's interesting about this is that 50% um, 50, 50 of respondents also said that the 2019 hemp year was not profitable for them, so they did not make a, make a profit last year. But 85% said that they're still gonna do it again. So this is a very interesting market. You've got very high thinking that it's very high risk. You didn't make a profit, but boy, you're going to jump back in and do it again. So very interesting, very interesting market right now. Um, this is a recent survey by, uh, what's 2019 survey by Hemp Benchmarks, which at the time that I got this information was actually publicly available information, but now they're behind a paywall. So you have to subscribe to, to Hemp Benchmark to get this information. So I guess I was lucky that I was able to get it right before it became unavailable. Um, so how many, uh, they asked, if this is a national survey, of how many acres did they plant? You've got a, a vast, uh, it, it's very interesting because it's bifurcated, right? You've got a lot of people doing less than two acres and a whole bunch doing over 50 acres. And then you've got some in between. So um, people kind of dabbling in or putting in a little bit and then going whole hog on it. Um, so it's interesting that there's no two to five acres. So it's either a little less than two or you jumped right into six or more. Uh, they also asked what was the generic cost per acre of, of hemp costs. And you'll see that um, about two thirds uh, say that their costs were less than $10,000 per acre. Tennessee budgets estimate the cost per acre to be about $15,000 per acre. And that's the, when the budget scenario that I'll show you, that's, um, that's, the part, that's the cost that I use to see where the break even is. Um, but then obviously there's uh, about that, maybe 16% that said that their costs were over $15,000 an acre. Uh, the top uh, figure is what was the expected yield per acre? Um, and the bottom is the, the targeted uh, selling point. 
so the top figure where it shows you that it's really just uh, really all over the place. Some people are getting less than 500 um, pounds per acre. Some people are giving over 2000. This is where you're seeing a lot of inexperience in the market and experienced growers coming in. Um, if this was a more experienced market, you'd have a more standard, um, you, you wouldn't have such a diverse set of numbers in terms of yield, yield per acre. Um, and so it's a little bit, um, there's a nice distribution, but you wouldn't, you don't want that kind of big distribution in, in the market. Um, so then we'll see targeted prices. You see that a lot of people had um, high expectations of prices, prices probably because uh, prices at the beginning of the season were close to $4. Um, and so you've got a vast majority of, of people that were in, came into the hemp market thinking that they were gonna get $2 or above in terms of uh, price uh, per, CBD, uh, per CBD per acre. Um, so again, this is CBD. Um, so use biomass wholesale pricing trends. Um, I square, I put a red square around where most people would fit if I'm using fit under 25,000 pounds. And so um, you see the pricing trends were definitely priced downwards. So in April 2019, prices were all the way up to $4.50. And as of January 2020, they were $1.31. And if you looked for in February, I saw some numbers that were about 70 cents. And so um, under a dollar. So there are, there's definitely a downward pricing trend. Could be that a lot of people are holding on to that and holding on to CBD, to biomass and trying to sell it in the spot market and those, and there's just a glut in the market right now. Um, and so looking at that, that downward trend, and I'm going to use the dollar 31 in the pricing scenario um, a little bit later. So here are some 2020 um, growing season prices as of, um, this was as of January, 2020. So um, you'll see that um, prices for are, are on a downward trend. Uh, they went up a little bit in January for CBD clones, but they're still in a downward trend from September, 2019. Um, and anecdotally, I've also seen that prices have even been lower than, than what I'm showing right now in January, 2020. So this can be a related to, there's just a lot of uncertainty in the market right now, whether it comes to, whether it's COVID-19, whether it's um, the regular, you know, the new interim rules that are coming in, figuring out what's, who's going to go in, the uncertainty of it. So even though 85% of people said, yeah, I'm going to go right in, there is still a lot of uncertainty in, in terms of the supply chain and production. And so this is where you're seeing the, the downward trend. And it's very similar in terms of what uh, Canada saw when they started growing hemp um, in a big, they saw a huge boom and then there was a bust and then there's a boom again. And, and then, um, and kind of things start to settle. And that's kind of this cyclical nature that you see um, in terms of, in, in terms of markets, particularly when they're brand new and they're, they're just opening up. So I'm going to use this revenue scenario of $1.31 that were the January, 2020 prices. Um, so uh, based on the contracts that I've seen, uh, most purchasers want at least 8% CBD. Most people that are growing are getting more than 8% CBD, but that's the minimum. So I'm going to use the contract price, the contract minimum price, and then go all the way up to, um, and then use like a 12% CBD. Um, so lower, if the lower yield is 500 pounds, we saw that some people were getting 500 pounds or less. Um, and the average is 1,000 and the higher yield is 2,200. I'm going to give you the rever re revenue scenarios for each. So if prices in January were $1.31 per percentage point for CBD per pound, at 8% CBD, you'd be getting $14.48 per pound. If you think about what I, the first uh, slides that I showed you, that CBD price was like 20 pound, was $20 was the minimum that anybody had bought me at. So this is well substantially below that $20 at the beginning of the, of the presentation. So if you have a low yield revenue, uh, would be $5,240 per acre, so you're losing money there. Average yield, if it's 1,000 pounds, still losing money if you're only doing 8% CBD. At higher yield, at 2,200 pounds, then you're starting to make some money at $23,000 per pound. I'm oh, sorry, per acre, excuse me. So here is a figure looking at some break even, again, using that January 2020, $1.31, uh, for and then so the blue line is an eight percent CBD and the orange line is twelve percent CBD and then I'm using that Tennessee budgeted uh, cost at fifteen thousand so you can look at break even so if you're doing eight percent CBD you need to get closer to that thousand uh, you need to get over that 
average um, yield per acre, right? You have to be closer. If you're doing 12% CBD, then you could be a little bit under that $1,000 per acre and still break even. Um, definitely if you're over um, 1,500 pounds per acre, you're starting to make substantial money per acre, maybe at the top of 2,000 pounds, uh, uh, 2,000 pounds per acre, you'd be making maybe $15,000 per acre if that, but it's looking at figuring out, okay, what's the minimum? If my, looking at this for yourself, what is the minimum price that I would be able to take? Where am I going to break even and we're going to make money? We all like to look at that. And looking uh, as I've always worked with startup businesses, everybody's always looking at what's the highest price and the highest yield. Well, you have to do some sensitivity analysis and figure out what would be the minimum yield and the minimum price that I could take and break even. And then, whoa, everything above that, I'm really making money, but really looking at break even and what does that look like for your own business. So I'm saying the average cost is $15,000 per acre. Obviously, some people found that their cost work could be lower than that. So um, these are average costs. So everybody, every business is going to have different costs. You can't look at your neighbor that's doing hemp and say, my costs are going to be exactly the same. That's not, how, that's not how it works, right? Some people have more experience. They can cut a corner here or there, and they can produce more. And so thinking about your own cost and what it takes for you to do this and then how much you're going to have to make to make money. Maria, can you repeat yes. again about not using the highest numbers in your performance? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I always say that um, you should look at the optimistic, what you think would, what's going to happen, right? Realistic and then pessimistic, because the banker always uses the pessimistic number that you put out there, not the optimistic or the realistic. So look at the pessimistic and say, I can still make it with that. If, if things go a little bit rough, I can still be okay. So yes, use your most pessimistic number. And maybe I'm just very risk averse. Maybe that's why I'm an, uh, in the, um, I'm a professor <laughs> out there with my own business. So I'm risk averse. So I always use the pessimistic portion, right? Um, so yeah, don't look at the highest number. And look at a range. Look at a range of data sources. Look at a range of prices. Uh, look at who's selling where. That's really important as well. And so just to give you an indication of how volatile this market can be. Um, so this is the source is from push.com. Um, and I thought it was really interesting. This is also looking at CBD. And um, you'll see that at the beginning of the season, August 2019, uh, the orange is the listing price. Listing price is over $45 per pound. The offer uh, of price was a little bit under $40 per pound. So well within the range of what we saw at the beginning. And the accepted offer price, so that's where they came in, came together, was, you know, a little bit over $45 per pound, but underneath the listing price and over the offer price. Um, when you go to November, well, we see um, markets basically going, prices going down. Uh, the actually accepted offer price is below the offer price, which means that people are getting substantially less money than, than they thought they were going to. And there was an auction in 2019, um, in November, 2000, in November 2019, where basically there was no, there were no bids, and um, the offers that were put out there were less than 15 cents, uh, 50 cents per pound, uh, per percentage point. So, um, looking at figuring out where you are in the market and how how cyclical this is in terms of pricing is really important. So this is, when I saw this, this was like, wow, this is really interesting because that means prices are really, really going down and you need to figure out where you're going to try to sell and at what point you're going to try to sell um, your product. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one of the first was on an early slide, you showed a lot of seeds were coming from uh, China, that they were mm -hmm. one of the highest producers. Any concerns with transmission of the coronavirus uh, from hemp seeds uh, produced from China? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't know. I don't know how long um, this is. This I don't know if they're still getting tons of seed right now with coronavirus. I don't know what the what's coming in or not right now, to tell you the truth. Um, I'm sure that people, if they're getting seed, there might be some, some concern at this point coming from anywhere, I would say, since it's not going to be just from China. Um, that would be a concern. Okay, another, uh, this is more of a comment. Uh, on one of your slides, you showed uh, Michigan, uh, how their numbers uh, rised, uh, rose uh, greatly. I think it was from five to 30,000. This uh, attendee said that that number was misreported and it was more like 15,000. 
So uh, okay. just a Good half to know. <laughs> FYI. Good to know. Another uh, question came in. Uh, you listed flour and biomass uh, prices. Can you tell us uh, when, what dates uh, were those uh, numbers collected? In? So those were very early in the season prices. So I believe those were April and May prices, if I'm not mistaken, if I can remember correctly. Of uh, 2019? Of 2019, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, these are all 2019, except for when um, some of the stuff when I said 2020, they're all 2019 prices. And those were early in the season 2019 prices. Uh, a question says that Canada seems to be the biggest marketer of hemp grain. Uh, did you have anything uh, that you wanted to share regarding grain? I don't. I don't know very much about um, hemp grain right now. I think no matter what uh, market or industry you're going to go into, you should think about um, what is what is happening? We tend to sometimes be very myopic in terms of like, well, I'm going to be in this industry, I'm going to do this, and you know, these are the high prices, and so it sounds like it's a great idea. And so I thought, um, as I would talk to anybody looking into the market of thinking of things to consider as you're going into hemp, whether you're starting or in it right now, it's something that a business should do, be doing all the time. And so some things to consider is actually defining what interest, industry you're in, and particularly with hemp, where you have so many different portions and it can be used for so many different things is figuring out what industry you're in thinking about industry rivalry so the more producers the more rivalry you're going to have and, and entry and exit also exacerbates rivalry looking at supplier power buyer power and i'll talk about these more in detail the health of the economy that's going to come into play right now as well in terms of COVID 19 so that could be sometimes it's going to be a good thing sometimes it can be a bad thing so for some industries, a bad economy can be bad. For some industries, a bad economy can, can actually uh, increase the demand for your product. So if you're doing CBD and it's being used for stress, right now people are really stressed out. And of course, government regulations will have a, a big to play. We've got that interim rule. We've got states doing different rules. So, so things to consider in, in terms of that. Defining who your competitors are. Sometimes your neighbor or the person doing exactly the same thing as you isn't your competitor. Um, it's uh, the product that can be substituted, like looking at substitute products, looking at new and existing competitors, um, barriers to entry and exit, and of course, just the general environment of what of where you're going into. And so when you're thinking about the bargaining power of, of customers, think about, so how powerful are my customers? How easily can they switch to another business? Um, how easily can they force me to change my prices? So for example, buyers of hemp biomass receive an average of a 20% discount off a thousand pound transaction if they purchase 300,000 pounds. So you, so you saw that I had put that red square around that zero to 25,000 pounds. And then the prices actually were smaller as the, um, as the more pounds you purchase. That's that discount that buyers are getting. So that means that the um, customers, your buyers actually have, um, your customers have a lot of power to be able to, to talk about prices. You saw that volatile uh, shape that I saw that that, op, that accepted offer price was a lot lower. That's the bargaining power of customers to make you take a lower price, right? So thinking about those things. So buyer power and government regulation. So um, we've got this interim final rule from USDA, which is through taking comments. Even SBA um, commented on those rules related to small businesses and how that was going to affect small farmers and small growers. So even SBA uh, has been has put some stuff out there. So this could result in an earlier earlier harvesting to avoid uh, that over 0.3% THC, which can lead to could lead to decreased CBD content. Which but if farmer if that contract is at 8%, so all these things kind of come into play. Right, you've got this government regulation that you need to think about, this buyer power of saying the contract says 8%, but now this regulation is counteracting how much CBD you could have. So thinking about those things and how they interplay together and how that could affect either contracting or your buyers. Uh, thinking about the bargaining power, power of suppliers. So how easily can my suppliers drive up prices? So if you're buying, um, seeds if you're buying clones. So how easily can they drive up prices? How easily can you switch to another supplier? Is it easy for you to just say, well, forget, it. I'm going to go to somebody else? Is there just a plethora of people selling these things or, or since selling you quality things, right? So there might be a lot of people out there, but they might not be selling you something that's quality. 
Um, so thinking about that. And how easily can your supplier integrate forward, right? So that also has that, gives that uh, supplier power over that market and, and can be able to either have higher costs or, or uh, contract terms that, that you might not want. Uh, thinking about new entrants, so how easily is it for new businesses to enter and take my customers? Um, barriers to entry can come from various sources, so that government, those government rules can make entry more harder. Um, we'll see how that works in terms of being able to have labs come in to test THC, um, all of those bottlenecks that could happen, so that might make new, ent uh, new entrants be more careful about coming in. So patents and proprietary knowledge, this is a new market. So you're going to have people come in with, with different technology. Asset specificity. So if you're looking at, for example, doing fiber, you might have the combines to be able to do those things. And so how does that asset specificity work for you in terms of entering the new market or others? Um, and then, of course, internal economies of scale or economies of scope. Um, and then exit barriers, limiting a firm's ability to leave the market can really exacerbate. So let's say you have all of these hemp growers now and they're in it and they, even if prices are low, they're still not gonna get out. They can sit on something. So that's gonna actually increase rivalry in the market, which means that you've got these lower prices coming in, right? Because it actually makes rivalry um, much, much, much worse. And so then um, when we're thinking about thinking about financing, so we saw that banks did receive guidance that the hemp industry could receive credit. Um, and when it comes through, uh, based on COVID-19, the CARES Act, uh, hemp growers and hemp industry, the hemp industry in general, is um, eligible to receive those small business loans. So um, mm -hmm. cannabis is not, but hemp is, it's legal, it's federally legal, so they, uh, they do have access to be able to access um, any of the small business loans through the CARE Act, which is that COVID-19 Act. Um, so financing is available for breakfast. Remember, they always look at that pessimistic number. <laughs> so look at that range of numbers when you're doing your business plan. And I'll say that um, if you're entering a market, you should have a business plan of some kind. I always think that the only people that are going to invest in, in your company without a business plan are the three Fs, friends, family, and fools. And if you don't want to be the fool that even invest your own money into your own business, you should have a business plan. <laughs> so, so thinking about that. Uh, the threat of substitute products. So, um, you know, particularly when it comes to either fiber or CBD oil, thinking about what other products are out there that are already satisfying these customers in terms of what my product would be used for. Um, how easy is it that my product is going to get into the market and substitute for it? Is it a good substitute? Is it a better substitute? Is it a better in terms of quality substitute or is it a better in terms of it's cost less substitute, right? That's going to have a big play into what's going to happen. So how likely are your customers to switch to another product or switch to your product, right? That, that threat of substitutes. And of course, like I was talking about rivalry, you know, how many competitors are you going to have? Um, can you take, um, can they take the, your customers and how can they take your customers or how can you take other people's customers? And to end, here are some resources. Um, you've got the hemp, the Purdue Hemp Project, uh, the University of Kentucky Hemp and Enterprise a CBD budget model that I was talking to, uh, and then the Tennessee budget model as well. Um, so those are pretty good resources to use.